as I look at you, families represented here, I can't help but know that Christ is still blessing Lake Forest, that he still has his eye upon this community, and he still loves its people because he is still serving you his gift of forgiveness, grace, and peace. Today, I would talk with you about the man who would be king. But first, let us pray. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life, so that, as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, last Sunday's gospel text showed us Jesus' lack of preoccupation with honor. In a culture that was focused on honor, Jesus didn't care about it, didn't need it, and did not seek it. The lack of healing in Nazareth was not because Jesus was either powerless or punitive. The lack of faith and honor to Christ by many of the residents of Nazareth did not weaken him, for he was able to lay hands on a few and heal them but it did keep them from being blessed when he was in their midst. And as we learn, the same holds true today. For the gospel is still the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. But for those who resist and reject God's word, it is the basis for God's righteous judgment because they have not believed in the name of the unique Son of God. Amen. God has placed Faith Lutheran here in Lake Forest for one purpose. Well, two purposes, actually. The first purpose for those of you who are here today is to hear God's word, to be strengthened by it, to be encouraged through it, to have your faith built up, and so that you may know that Christ is for you. And for those who are not a part of this assembly, who have not been united to Christ through baptism into his death and resurrection. God uses faith Lutheran as the vessel, the means through which his word goes forth into this community. And so God still desires all people to be saved in Lake Forest, hence you are here. In today's gospel text, Mark takes us from Jesus to Herod. Herod, the man who would be king. Herod, having heard of Jesus but not having faith in Christ. So he looks for an alternative explanation for the things that he's heard about this man from Galilee. See, not having the word in him. Herod, the Tetrarch the man who would be king, reaches outside the word to explain the reports about this strange, powerful man who wouldn't be in his shoes. Let's talk more about Herod. He's a man who wanted to be recognized and respected, but he really hadn't done anything noteworthy. That is, until he got married to his sister-in-law, Herodias. Now, as the text told us, she was married to his brother Philip until she wasn't. We learn that John the Baptist declared God's law against this to Herod, and in response, Herod arrested him. But based on what happens later, I wonder if it wasn't Herodias who instigated the conditions that necessitated the arrest. Mark 6, beginning at verse 17, says, For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, 
his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful. Literally, it's not proper for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. You know, it would seem like, under the circumstances, the safest place for John the Baptist was in Herod's prison because Herodias did not like what she was hearing. It wasn't just that John the Baptist was making her husband look bad. See, the problem was in an honor culture, anything that you do that is not fitting, that is not proper, costs honor. And honor is something that is not in great supply. And when you want to be king, or more importantly, when you want your husband to be king, how many of you all have heard the saying, behind every successful man, there stands a woman? Married men, it's okay. You can raise your hand. You won't get in trouble. The fact is, most successful men get there with the help and support of a loving wife. And that also means if that gets twisted or corrupted somehow through sin, that what was meant to be a blessing by God can become a curse. Uh, the same Bible that tells us what a blessing marriage is also says that it is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than to live with a contentious wife. Don't laugh, husbands. I don't want you to get in trouble. But the fact remains, Herod was in a predicament. He was torn between respecting the prophet and wanting to please his wife. He was torn between his desire to be rid of the convicting proclamations of John and his desire to be respected at home and in the community so he listened to John, and he listened to Herodias. And then one night at a party, Herod got in over his head. The dance of Herodias' daughter induced Herod's mouth to write a check that his honor had to back. She twisted. He shouted. And then she demanded the head of John the Baptist. While the guests of the banquet watched, Herod searched for a way out, but found nothing. Who would he betray? His honor or the prophet? What would you do? Well, actually, it really doesn't matter, because that's not the point of this passage. Go ahead, you can relieve the sigh of relief now, fellas. The point of this passage isn't John's sacrifice or Herod's weakness. This sermon is not about being a good husband, being an honorable person, or any of that stuff. The point of this passage, this pericope, is that Herod didn't know Christ. And so he explained Jesus' power as being because he was actually John the Baptist come back from the grave. Rather than accept Jesus' testimony concerning himself, Rather than seeing the works as confirmation of Jesus' message concerning the kingdom of God, Herod chose a vague, unscriptural concept that made John the Baptist a reincarnated Superman. Contrary to all that the scriptures had said about both John and Jesus. Now, the Bible is God's word to us, as it is written, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Saints, most people believe that they want to be good. Most people say they want justice. But we live in a world today that has seemingly convinced himself, itself rather, that you can find an alternative to the 
true way, to the old path, to the way of God, which is perfect, converting the soul. They think they can find a righteousness that rejects the righteousness of God. They can find a way to make this world better by simultaneously rejecting the one who made this world and all that's in it. Now, faith comes by hearing, and hearing from the word of Christ. But if you refuse to hear it, you won't believe. Herod refused to hear and believe, preferring to reject and explain away. Many people today follow the same path. Rejecting the clear testimony of the gospel, they create a different Jesus, proclaim a different gospel that is no gospel at all. And some of them are sitting in church today as we sit here. Some of them are singing in choir, standing in pulpit, sitting in pews right now. And Jude wrote about them, saying in his epistle, verse 12, these are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever." Oh, yes, they say great, mighty, swelling words. They disrupt your Bible studies with the newest, latest heretical theories. They challenge the validity of true worship, bring in innovations that take the focus away from Christ and place it upon us, and then look surprised and hurt when they're challenged as to why they are attempting to do these things. They accuse you of having the problem. What they don't understand is that we do what we do because it reflects our Bible-based, Christ-centered theology. We're not chasing God because he's promised to come to us. We're not looking for God to do a new thing because we cling to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And we're not trying to make our worship familiar to the lost. Because in order to worship in spirit and in truth, you must be born from above by the word of God, which lives and remains forever. Amen? And we're not trying to give you a unique spiritual experience. Because baptism now saves you. Just like it saved every generation that came before you, and it's going to save every generation that comes after you till Jesus comes back. We even confess that in our confessions. The Augsburg Confession, Article 6, concerning new obedience, it's also taught that such faith should yield good fruit and good works and that a person must do such good works as God has commanded for God's sake but not place trust in them as if thereby to earn grace before God. For we receive forgiveness of sin and righteousness through faith in Christ. That's what we believe, teach, and confess. That's what we're about as confessional and evangelical Christians. And those confessions that were published over 500 years ago weren't a new spiritual illumination. They were the tried and tested exposition of Scripture that followed the teachings of the apostles. Whatever you want, whether it's justice or peace, favor, even respect, God's got it. And he gives us everything that we need through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and virtue. And you don't have to go somewhere to seek the Lord, for he's told you in John 12 and 32, and I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people 
to myself. Amen. You know, people of God, I don't need a miracle to get excited about Jesus. Do you? <laughs> In fact, I get excited when I think about Jesus Christ and him crucified, as it's written in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ, the one who knew no sin. There is no one else on earth, either past, present, or future, who can make that claim. Jesus Christ, the one who became sin for us. There is no one else, no other name you can name that's done that for you, because there's no one else that could do that for you. But yet, People expect us to follow folk who are just as sinful as we are, just as, ne as much needing a Savior as we are, but we're supposed to follow them because they think they know something, that they've got something new, that they've got something that'll fix the world. Believe me, if the work of man could fix the world, Jesus would have stayed where he was. You know, I'm like the man who was in the Gadarenes or the man who was born blind. The Lord came to me one day in his word. He revealed himself to me and he changed me. Now, like, unlike the blind man, I, I, I didn't have a physical change. Unlike the man in the Gadarenes, I, I didn't have a cataclysmic change to some, you know, I wasn't walking around cutting myself or having to be in chains. I, uh, my eyes worked fine. But I can tell you this, that there is a difference in my life when the Word of God came to me and revealed himself to me. There's a difference in the lives of those who have heard that Christ is for you. And so they're no longer trying to find whatever it is that the world says they'll give you if you just put in the work. They found in him a resting place, as the old song goes, and he has made me glad. The truth is, saints of God, Christ died for you. That is truth. God tasted death for you. That is truth. Not just my truth. Not just maybe it works for me. No, that is absolute truth. Christ died for you. Herod put John to death and felt shame and regret. Jesus died in your place so that you could know, not feel, but know the peace that passes all understanding. And so I travel from place to place, and I live in Gary, Indiana, because Jesus Christ is risen, and he told us to make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that he commanded. God placed you here in this community, this city, because the Bible says that God appointed to every man the times and seasons of his habitation. God put you in this nation because God appointed your time. If God had wanted to, he could have caused you to be born before the gospel was preached. But he didn't. God put you here now. God has a purpose for you here and now. God has placed his word in your heart here and now for the reason of making known his good deeds. And in a world where people claim that they want authenticity and brag about keeping it 100, what is more authentic? The notion that we are able by doing the work to bring about a perfect society? <laughs> no. It's the truth of Romans 3, 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So neither self-indulgence nor self-loathing have done anything for you. So why seek for the living 
among the dead. Fighting for or even attaining to political power have done nothing for you. Why seek ye the living among the dead? And chasing after money or trying to make deals with Satan have done nothing for you. I think you get where I'm going with this, don't you? When you accept Jesus at his word and believe that his exceeding great and precious promises are yes and amen and that they are for you, not as the crumbs that fall from the table, but that they were designed and intended for your ears to go into your heart and come into your mind and go into your soul and transform your life, then the wisdom of the Holy Spirit shows you that the wisest response to God's good news is to come boldly to the throne of grace rather than trying to find another way. You know, people have been trying and failing for over 2,000 years to show that the Bible is false. Theories have come and gone, but God's word stands. The testimony of Jesus Christ stands. And when you receive it and put your trust in him, Christ enables you to stand. So let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord, and let God's people say, Amen.